up on West Side Stories, a change to an existing Michigan drinking law could have major implications for minors. Plus, we take an inside look at the rising popularity of esports. And we visit with a local Army veteran who has dedicated his life to training dogs for public service. All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories, I'm Preston Donikowski. And I'm Kelly Hubbard. As of January 1st, the state of Michigan has changed the underage drinking law from a misdemeanor to a civil infraction. That means for underage drinkers that are caught, they'll be paying from their pocket instead of paying from behind bars. West Side Stories reporter Sam Shepperman helps us understand the fine print in Michigan's new MIP law. So my previous experiences with MIPs uh, pretty much summed up, I got two of them. John, our anonymous source, is just one of the many people who were affected by the old minor in possession laws. Previous to the amendment, any minor in possession or consumption of alcoholic content was subject to a misdemeanor charge. Acting Director of Public Safety and Chief of Police, Brandon DeHaan, gives us a brief overview on what the changes are to this law. Since January 1, 2018, the law surrounding minor in possession in the state of Michigan has changed. Perhaps the largest change that goes with that law is that the law has been decriminalized for the first offense. The decriminalization means that instead of receiving a misdemeanor citation or going in front of a judge for every offense, the offense now is a civil infraction. That civil infraction is very similar to what perhaps someone would get for a speeding ticket or a stop sign ticket within the state of Michigan. DeHaan says that only the first offense has changed with the new amendment. Along with the ticket for the first offense, minors will still have to go to substance abuse classes, community service, or even probation. The second offense has remained the same, a misdemeanor charge with court time, possibility of jail, as well as suspension of driver's license. The third offense, also remaining the same, is similar to the second offense, only more costly and longer chances of jail time and suspension of license. DeHaan says that with these changes to the minor possession law, Grand Valley State University will most likely see MIPs as the number one ticketed offense. In the past, minor in possession has been our number one arrest. Uh, with the change in the law, it will most likely be our number one citation, uh, as it is not a arrest or an arrestable offense. It does occur quite often, and again, the reason why the university takes a very proactive stance is to reduce overall crime on the campus. Being a ticketable offense for first-time offenders, John says he understands why the law has changed the way it has but he still believes that people need to be smart about what they do. My advice is, first of all, be smart. Uh, obviously, don't put yourself at risk or anybody else at risk, more importantly. Really, that's what it comes down to. Now, the level that, that gets punished, like, it's illegal. The drinking age is 21. So, how I feel about that doesn't, isn't gonna change the issue, but if you're drinking under 21, there's a potential for you to get caught. GVSU Police Department advises minors who are drinking to understand that these records are recorded onto their driving records. Any potential employers in the future can request these records. In Allendale, I'm Sam Stratferman. While GVSU and the GVPD are making it clear they do not encourage minors to drink, they do ask underage students who choose to drink alcohol to be smart and responsible adults and to call 911 in an event of an emergency. For this next story, reporter Jessica Kroll heads to a dog training outfit run by an Army veteran called the West Michigan Canine. It's a sign you should take seriously. 
Some of the dogs here at West Michigan K-9 are being trained as police attack dogs, but the trainers work hard to ensure everyone stays safe. West Michigan K-9, we do a lot of different things. So we primarily train dogs, obviously, for the public. Uh, we also train dogs for military, police, uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we train protection dogs. And then we also train service dogs. Stephen Parent, the founder of West Michigan K-9, says his love of dogs began as a child when he went hunting for the first time. He was with his uncle and his uncle's dog, Ginger. He said Ginger was commanded to hunt and then shortly returned chasing a rabbit. In that moment, I remember the feeling if I could bottle it up and give it to people, I think it would change the world. But I remember being seven, eight years old and seeing that and going like, Wow, that was seeing a dog work for a man, help him get dinner, and I was hooked and I was fascinated. I remember going home after that weekend, riding my bike to the library and getting every book I could on dogs. And that love for dogs. I'm obsessed with them. Has continued throughout his working career. Joined the military, worked with dogs in the military. Um, I got out of the military, I started training dogs almost immediately. I had really good jobs outside. Uh, but I just kept going back to the dog thing. I just couldn't let it go. Parent and the staff at West Michigan K-9 are in the process of donating a service dog to a veteran and also a police dog to the Nuego Police Department. It's trained for narcotics, uh, tracking lost people, tracking bad people, and handler protection, so it'll protect the handler uh, in the case something would go sideways. He says they aim at donating four to five dogs every year. Good deeds like this at West Michigan K-9 have not gone unnoticed. I went to the mailbox at my golf cart, pulled out a manila envelope that said White House. And I was like, this is either really good or really bad. The White House don't mail people stuff. And I opened up the envelope very, in fact, I got adrenaline and got a little scared. And I drove back down here, got found my own private little space and opened it up. And inside was a letter and then a presidential coin. The letter and coin from former President Barack Obama commend his work with service dogs for veterans. Training these dogs can be a difficult task, but according to Parent, saying goodbye is the hardest part. We build relationships and bonds with the dog. There's no way we can't. Uh, everybody that works here is here because they love what they do. In West Olive for West Side Stories, I'm Jessica Kroll. Parent says he's continuing to expand his business with another location set to open in Florida very soon. These days, it seems videos on social media are going viral faster than ever. That certainly was the case for GVSU freshman Hope Wadley. As Reagan Blissett tells us, Hope's music has become an overnight sensation. Every single morning, Hope Wadley wakes up and comes to the common room of the Hills dorm. Except one morning turned out a little differently. She sat right here and played the piano. And she recorded a song to tweet out. And over 15,000 likes later, Hope Wadley has become a viral sensation. Closure without closure, a voice that never spoke. Wheatley had no idea that people would love the song as much as she did. But over 120,000 streams later on Spotify and almost a half a million views, people just can't get enough. Yeah, during that time in my life was really just overthinking a lot, kind of driving myself nuts. Um, and I really just wanted to film it so that in case I didn't have closure with anybody, maybe that would help. Wadley is no stranger to music. She first started singing and writing songs when she was six years old. Now you can find her on iTunes and Spotify. Last fall, her extended play featured six original songs. Her roommate, Sheila Babbitt, thinks Wadley rightfully deserves the spotlight. Like, it's like, oh, she's like, she deserves everything, all the attention, because she's so humble. It's cool to be like, whoa, that's my roommate. Like, she's doing big things. To Wadley, her music means friendship, as she thinks of her songs as friends. She enjoys the freedom to create people and stories within her songs, people she can relate to, people she might want to be friends with. I think it's hard to understand unless you get it, but I just love being able to write a song as if it, you're writing a person and you have this blank page, like a blank person, and you just throw in whatever characteristic you want them to have. And they're able to be exactly what you need during that time. I was never 
She hopes her listeners find a friend in her music too, which people can do online or on the street. Whaley's also a street performer trying to raise a little cash. People will find her barefoot and singing with her guitar in Ann Arbor. Every different place is a different sound, a different song. So I like to travel around and just hear all the different music that places have. Weedley's travels can be found in her music, but when she's not singing or writing songs, she's just like every other college student. Some customers are amazed finding out she's a singer. She mentioned music. She said she was going home over break and she's like, oh, I got the note, got to bring my notebook. And I'm like, what's the notebook? And she's like, oh, it's where I write all my songs and I make music. I'm like, oh, do you, are you on iTunes or something? She's like, yeah. And she's like, get, you know, told me her name and I looked it up and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Wadley hopes to continue to surprise people with her talents while dreaming big and hoping her listeners enjoy her music too. If I ever got the opportunity to open for a band and just tour, that would be a dream. Um, I'd absolutely love that. Waitley hopes to build that stronger connection with her audience. In Allendale, I'm Reagan Blissett. You know, Preston, I think Wadley's success is really going to inspire some others out there. I completely agree. Just just watching that, I mean, I'm inspired to, to go out and try to be creative for once. But switching gears now, earlier this month, ESPN reported that Blizzard Entertainment's Overwatch League attracted more viewers than Thursday Night Football, and that has raised some eyebrows. Koi Wynn has more on the rise of competitive gaming. Video games have really evolved in the last 10 years. It used to be that playing video games was a hobby for children to pass the time. Today, with the rise of online gaming, players are competing in esports for large prize pools. Business Insider estimates that nearly 400 million people watch competitive video games. Many who watch also play. Gamers like Michael Mercursi believe that competitive video games has helped shape who he is. I think it really helped uh, with like problem solving and stuff. I think that came in. I think it was very useful for like school and I, I, teamwork is a big part of a lot of them. So I mean, it, it helped me develop you know personal skills and you know team building. Not to mention the the support networks and friends that I've made. I mean, I can't say I'd be the same without either of those things. While playing video games has helped McCursey, others like Sophie Ricky, they do it to fulfill a competitive urge. So I more recently got into esports just because I played like real like physical sports um, growing up. So I learned about Overwatch through some friends and I just really enjoyed the game. I thought it was really fun. I really liked the art design and all the heroes just looked really cute. <laughs> So I decided to pick that up, and then ever since then, I've been playing since season three of Overwatch. It is clear that esports appeals to many young adults, but to continue to grow, it has to capture the attention of an older audience, an audience who hasn't experienced online gaming. Thinking back when I was in junior high school in the 1980s was when home video game systems were first starting to come into vogue. And I remember having long discussions, even in junior high school, about, you know, this is something that's pretty important and you might want to pay attention to it. And people now who would be long since retired said, we don't think this is for real. We, don't, we think this is a fad. It's going to pass. It, it takes a long time for, for things to entrench, you know. It's going to take a, a sustained period of... Um, of success, I think, before you see that, that commitment happen. While many trends have come and gone, it seems like esports is here to stay. Market researcher Superdata estimated that last year the global esports industry earned over $1.5 billion. I think it's validated it for a lot of people, especially um, older folks. So now that you can see, like, you know, CSGO or whatever other game on TV, I think that really changed things because it became not, you know, a little like pastime of, of children, it became these things with these giant sponsors and these massive prize pools um, with the corporate backing. With the popularity of competitive gaming on the rise, companies like Turner Broadcasting and ESPN have invested in televising esports events. But even with all the new attention, Ricky says that video games are still about having fun. I just personally love gaming and I think that a lot of stigmas need to go away from it. And I think that it can be, like, people see it oftentimes, especially, like, as a female gamer, like, it can seem toxic, but I think you just have to look at it for playing it for fun as well. Like, if you do play it competitively, that's great, but at the end of the day, it is something that should be fun and loved, and I just think it's a really, really good thing for everybody. 
the growth of competitive gaming has caught the attention of some big investors, with people such as the New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft and New York Mets owner Fred Wilpon investing in their own esports teams. It looks like esports has a bright future. Reporting for West Side Stories, I'm Koi Wynn. This year, esports has taken a major step forward with eight U.S. cities fueling their own esports teams in order to compete in the Overwatch League. This year, one of Ottawa County's oldest eateries is celebrating an important milestone. West Side Stories reporter Jake O'Donnell has the story behind the restaurant and its deeply rooted family connection. Located just off of I-96 in the quiet West Michigan town of Nunica is Turk's Tavern, a local establishment that's been serving up good times and good eats since 1933. Turk's has a long and storied history in Ottawa County. It was originally opened as a pool and dance hall by Fred Turk Allison shortly after the end of Prohibition. It stayed in his possession until about 50 years ago when the business was purchased by Roger and Francis Holmes who have kept it in their family ever since. Today, their daughter Francine and her husband Rick own Turks, and their niece, Tiffany Holmes, serves as general manager. We have a lot of locals and family members that do dine here as well, along with other people from outside the area, from the Grand Rapids area, Muskegon area. Um, it's nice to have that family atmosphere to bring families here, and that a family owns it, and it keeps it like that cozy, um, fun atmosphere as well. For Turks, it's all about location, location, location. Its proximity to a major highway, as well as its place in a small town, has allowed the restaurant to develop a unique style that keeps travelers and locals alike coming back. There's not much around here. Turks is kind of a staple right off the highway, right off of 96, which is an easy on, easy off. But we use local products, um, local produce. It just people were known for that freshness. I think that's what keeps people coming back and making Nunica a staple for having Turks here. Katie Potter has been working as a waitress for three years now and time and time again has witnessed the love Turks receives from all who visit the old roadhouse. People come here from all over the place, specifically come to Turks. Um, and people, if we're on an hour and a half wait, they don't mind. They'll wait because they came for Turks. I mean, this is a great place to come. 2018 serves as Turks' 85th anniversary, and Holmes says that two of the keys to the restaurant's longevity are its family-centric atmosphere and, of course, the food. Not. Um, being in the family, I think, is a huge part for at least 50-some years. Um, that's huge that people know it's been the same family for that many generations and that many years, and hopefully to continue to go on for family members. We've had a lot of the same food items, so we are known for the burgers. We have great half-pound hand-padded burgers that keep people coming back, like that rosy burger that's been on the menu for many years. We're also known for pork chops. We've had a breaded pork chop that's been on our menu since the 50s as well. And so that keeps people coming back when we haven't changed recipes as well. To observe such an important milestone, Holmes says that Turks will be pulling out all the stops. We recently just um, purchased some t-shirts, so those will be up for sale. Um, 85 years is kind of a big staple, so we want to be able to you know, show that in the restaurant as well. All the servers will be wearing t-shirts promoting 85 years. Also, we'll have different specials um, we'll be running for the 85 years, and hopefully you know, we'll do drink specials and have maybe, maybe a little celebration if it, it allows us to. We just want to thank everyone for all their support and hope to have new guests come give us a try, and we we'll hope to see everyone soon. Turks has had 85 years to perfect its unique family atmosphere. As for the food, well, you'll have to come see for yourself. For now, you'll have to excuse me. I have a burger I have to go enjoy. Reporting from Nunica, I'm Jake O'Donnell. Thanks, Jake. If you'd like to help Turks celebrate their 85th anniversary as part of the Greater Grand Rapids community, you can find the restaurant just off I-96, exit 10 on Cleveland Street. It's that time in our show when we bring you a story from WGVU Digital Studios. This week, Art Unfiltered host Shelley Irwin visits the Mental Health Foundation of Michigan in Grand Rapids and interviews artist Ivan Jensen. It's cold outside. We gotta go in. And here we are with Jessica from the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan. Good things that you do. We're on our way to see an artist that supports your foundation. But before we go there, what is the foundation all about? Yeah, so the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan is the go-to source for mental health awareness and education throughout West Michigan and beyond. 
our leading program is the Be Nice program. You've probably seen the logo around town on shirts um, and it stands for Notice, Invite, Challenge and Empower. So it's more than a phrase, it's an action plan. Yeah, so be nice, start yesterday. How can the community support your foundation? We have a lot of community events that happen throughout the year. Um, two of our big events are Stomp Out Stigma and the Shining Through event, um, which is an art show and auction, which is where we met Ivan. And uh, those are two ways that we get awareness and education and donors together. Great, right. let's all be nice, thanks. Well, here we are with, we'll call you a renowned artist, author, local grammar pitian, Ivan Jensen. Ivan, congratulations on your success. You. How do you do it? How, do you, how are you so good? Well, I, at an early age, I wanted attention, so I decided to get good at something. And so one of the things I got good at, for instance, was being funny, and I would get everyone to laugh. Another thing was I became fascinated with art at an early age, and I actually taught myself how to draw by copying uh, Michelangelo drawings and Leonardo da Vinci drawings, and I just, uh, people were laughing at me at first, and my family, that I thought I could take that on, but after about six months, I, I really was starting to get something going, and my mother used to put up the drawings on the refrigerator, and then I started to develop, and... Uh, they would send me actually to Costa Rica, where I made my first sculpture at the age of nine, and just to get me out of their hair, because I was so hyperactive, and uh, I ended up making a pretty quality sculpture there and surprised everybody. Mm. Let's start with your drawings. What's your niche? Faces? Well, um, <clears throat> I think well, the eyes was really the only thing. I'm self-taught, uh, mostly, and uh, but someone taught me how to do eyes, and I think that's a key element in my art, is a look in the eyes to attract the viewer, uh, kind of like the way Mona Lisa looks at us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do feature, most of my art is, is figurative or faces, and so I do a lot of faces, and I, sometimes I'll do uh, famous people. I, I once paid in Malcolm Forbes, uh, Forbes magazine, he commissioned me to make his last portrait. I've painted Belinda Carlisle of the Go-Go's, and I've also painted the, my version of Van Gogh. I like to paint Van Gogh a lot. It's kind of a trademark of mine. I'll do large-scale six-foot paintings of him, and yes. they're pretty popular. Yes. Now put your author hat on. What's laid here? Well, what's happening yes, what's is, happening? well, I've got this new book called Gypsies of New Rochelle, and uh, it's out on paperback and Kindle, and what this is, it's a story of uh, the 80s. Um, Sean uh, Aldridge is, is 17 years old in the 80s, and he's got an eccentric family, and his sister is going to play Carnegie Hall, much like my sister did, and uh, they've got a cousin who's caught up in a Hare Krishna type cult, and they've got a crazy uh, manager named Carrie Casey, who's kind of devilish, and uh, it's just the mishaps. It's a very comic novel, and I kind of take my family lore and turn it upside down and twist it all around mm. and uh, make it into a kind of a comic romp. It's kind of like an Augustine Burroughs book, like a running with scissors. Mm -hmm. okay, they're calling it a fictional memoir. It's in many ways a memoir, but then I take, um, have a little bit of magical realism in it. You are to be praised, Ivan, for your love and your support of mental health, especially here in our area. Why is that so important to you? Well, you know, I kind of had uh, a breakdown in New York City where I felt that I couldn't go on uh, the way I was going. Uh, my career had peaked. I'd sold paintings for ten, fifteen thousand a painting, but I was kind of leveling off, and I was having to make so many paintings a week just to get by. And one day, I just pretty much mentally collapsed, and it led to me coming to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to be with family. And so I. Ended up staying on here but uh, it changed my path and one incredible thing about it is if I hadn't come here and stopped that road temporarily I wouldn't have discovered that I was a writer and I, I joined a writers group here and writing became a way to heal myself because I could take all my uh, angst and all my stories that I've been through I had a crazy life living in New York City as an artist in, in, in the 80s and and uh, and channel it and I could channel any issue I had and channel it into a book and, and that would be a healing experience and if I can make people be entertained by something that that might have bothered me or, or been difficult for me then I've, I've really triumphed you know so I think that if I hadn't had the breakdown I'd never become a writer also you know which is my new um, way that I've reinvented myself. 
Thank you for doing that. You ever painted yourself? Well, it's interesting. Someone recently called me and they wanted me to make a six foot by ten foot painting. And they said, could you do a self-portrait? And I said, I think you're mistaken because sometimes people will say self-portrait when they mean portrait. I said, are you mistaken? They said, no, we want you to paint you. Yeah. Me? I said, me, 10 foot by 6. I said, if you want, fine. But I do do self-portraits, yeah, sure. Looking forward to that. I'm in Jensen. As always, a special thanks to WGVU Digital Studios for that story. Callie, before we wrap up real quick, I want to give a big shout out to the cast, the crew, everyone behind the scenes here at West Side Stories for bringing home first place at the Michigan Association of Broadcaster Awards for Best Daily Newscast. So a big thank you to everyone that's been a part of this from start to finish. But now that is all we have for this week. I'm Preston Anikuski. And I'm Kelly Hubbard. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice.